دكتورة سليمة ممكن أبدأ تزي؟ السلام عليكم. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this workshop um, organized by the Continuing Education Unit at the University of Baghdad uh, College of Pharmacy. We are delighted uh, today to invite Dr. Ola uh, from Western New England University uh, to talk about, about uh, professional uh, health care, quality care for uh, autistic uh, patients and uh, her tells of tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Ola Ghanim graduated from Faculty of Pharmacy Mansoura University in Egypt with a Bachelor in Science and a Master in Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, she moved to the U.S. shortly after where she had received her PhD degree from University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Secrets Research Institute. She is currently an associate professor at Western New England University in Springfield, Miami, uh, sorry, Maryland. Uh, prior to that, she was an associate professor at the University of St. Joseph and an associate assistant professor at Qatar University. Her research is focused on autism spectrum disorder in the last 15 years, and she's funded nationally and internationally. Uh, her interest is on autism from several aspects, drug design and development via bifunctional uh, serotonin uh, ligands, burden of uh, autism, quality of life for families with autism, quality of life for autistic students in North uh, America universities, and pharmacist patient communication gap, just to name a few. She is a writer and contributor to Autism and Us and the founder of Tales of Tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Ola, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening and uh, welcome, we are delighted to have you and please uh, start your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kovder, and thank you, uh, Baghdad, University of Baghdad, for the kind invitation. Salam alaikum, everyone, and good evening, your time. It's, a, it's such a delight to be here and uh, accepting the invitation uh, by Dr. Kovder and her team. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about the quality care for adult patients on the autism spectrum. As Dr. Kovder mentioned, I am an associate professor at Western New England University in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and currently it's 2 p.m. our time and my background is actually the university. So just to give you, you know, a hint of what is this all about. So today we will be Today, what are we learning about today? So my, my plan for the, for the next hour is to, to cover three main areas. I'm gonna talk to you about autism awareness. Actually, Autism Awareness Day is on April 2, so this is perfect timing. So are we all aware? And then I'm gonna talk about autism knowledge and skills to see if we are prepared. And we here means healthcare professionals uh, in general, and uh, some of us might be parents as well. And then I'm going to talk about autism training for professionals and for parents. And with that, I'm going to tell you about the tales of tomorrow as well. All right, are we ready? I'm going to ask you questions. All right, so first, are you aware? So autism in general, for those of you who would see this ribbon, it's a puzzle of a very colorful ribbon representing autism and autism awareness. So basically, why did we choose, not me, why in general the puzzle piece was chosen? was chosen because of the complexity and mystery of the complex. Two, why the puzzle pieces are in, two, in so many different shapes and, uh, and colors, because it represents us. It comes in all ethnicity, all race, all uh, socioeconomic uh, levels. It does not discriminate. And why the colors are so bright? Because it represents hope. So that is the meaning of the ribbon. So, you know, for, for uh, autism awareness, this is the symbol and that's the meaning. So now questions. So I have like four questions. So please just type it in the chat or shout it out up to you. So according to CDC in 2021, the autism spectrum disorder or ASD as we're gonna be referring to for the rest of the talk today is identified in what? What is the number? A, B, C, or D? Right, we have a couple of people responding. Give it a few more seconds.
All right. So the answer is actually A. We have the majority of the respondents uh, mentioned A, and A is correct. One in 44 children. I know it is, it is a shock to some of us to hear this number. Actually, the number increased 241% since year 2000. So it went actually from back in the 70s, was one in 10,000. And now it's climbing up, up to one in 44 in 2021. I know there's so many factors for this uh, percentage. Don't You have to take it with a grain of salt. There's uh, more awareness, there are more testing, there are more early intervention. There's so many that has been done uh, since uh, the, in the last 20 years or so, and that can be part of it. But regardless, this is a number we're dealing with. All right, question two. Autism can be identified by the way the person look. Just think, I mean, there is no harm of trying. I've seen some now coming. A few seconds. All right, we have the majority saying B, which is correct. Actually, autism is very hard to be identified by the person, by the way the person look. If you are expert in the field and you worked with autistic children for many, 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 many years, you might be able to get some, some information from the way they look. But look at these you know, beautiful children in front of you. They all look so normal to me. Sometimes if you, if you really, really focus on the picture, you might see that they don't necessarily look to the camera. They don't interact with the camera. They're, um, uh, eye contact is, is a little like all over the place. Uh, so you can probably tell like this uh, young kid here, he's looking away. She's looking like giving the side look. He probably look to the camera, but not at the camera. You know, you might be able to get, but the answer is no. So you answered it correctly. You cannot identify autism by just the way they look. Actually, I would advise everybody, please don't try. It's, it's better not to try and not assume things than, than try and, and, and diagnose someone or, or interpret some, the way they look in a different way. All right, question three. What do you think in the autism community, self-advocates prefer to call themselves what? Person with autism, person who has autism, autistic person or autism sufferer. What do you think? There is a little debate here, so a couple of answers might be acceptable. Okay. This is a great group. We have interaction here. All right. So I've seen, let me see. I've seen A and C like consistently, which is correct actually. C is what they prefer to call themselves. A is what is the literature is calling them. So both are, you're gonna see both. You're gonna see person with autism and you're gonna see autistic person. Self-advocates, those who have autism and actually can speak on their behalf, they like autistic person because they feel like it's, it's more like, like a diabetic person or someone, um, it's just, it's part of them. It is not, you know, they don't like person who has autism because they feel like it's something is like, it's a burden that they are carrying, but autistic person give them some identity in a, in a proud way, not in a, in a bad way. But in the literature, you're gonna hear person with autism as well, or person on the spectrum. You're gonna hear all of that. But yeah, so good discussion here. And last question is, which of the following describe the expressive and receptive communication of an autistic person? Verbal only, nonverbal only, both, none. And here is what I mean by nonverbal. So we all understand verbal. So verbal means talking, just like what, what I'm doing right now. Nonverbal can be anything else. So it can be eye contact, facial expression, uh, touches, body movement, body language.
I still also see a couple. All right, I see also debate. This is great, I like that. I like the discussion that we have some debates in here. The, an the answer is actually A. So they have difficulty with both verbal and nonverbal communication. And we're gonna explain that in details in the next few slides. Not because they are able to speak, you can interpret that as they have language. And not because they are not able to speak, you should not interpret that as they don't have a way of communication. And that makes it really complex. All right, so that was the question about the awareness. So what is actually ASD? So ASD, autism spectrum disorders, are a complex lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder. Usually it is diagnosed in the first three years of the person's life, and usually it lasts throughout their lifetime. Autism is a spectrum. Please remember that. It is not um, simple as diabetes or hypertension, or you just have a number and then you can identify hypertension. If your blood pressure is above this number, you have hypertension done. Autism is not like that. Autism is a spectrum and spectrum means a whole spectrum. And that means every individual is unique, which is really why I put this in here. Always unique, totally intelligent, sometimes mysterious. Uh, prevalence. We talked about prevalence. 1% of the world population actually has ASD. It strikes boys more than girls. So I'm, I'm sure you know uh, those who are with us now in the uh, on the Zoom call, you probably know someone that uh, on the spectrum. Um, you probably know more boys than girls, and that's that's the ratio, so four to one. It occurs in all racial, uh, ethnic, and social group, groups, and that's actually why the puzzle have all of those colors that we talked about. There is no single cause for autism, and there is no cure per se. All what you are trying to cure is improving symptoms. So basically, autism in Arabic means tawahud. So tawahud means they are by themselves, right? So symptoms is symptomatic, is trying to reduce that symptoms that make them by themselves and try to bring them back to our world. And quality of life become a key here. Quality of life of the individual themselves and those family and caregivers who care for them. And that becomes the goal. When I was in Qatar University, I had a very, very interesting study about quality of lives of caregivers for children with autism in Qatar, and that was published in Autism back in 2012. This is my highest uh, citation publication among everything I've done in my life. This is, um, I have the link again at the end of the presentation. You can check it out if you would like to. It was very interesting results to, to gather. So let's now talk about the signs and symptoms of autism. And there are 14 signs and I put them in here for you in a visual way because I found this is the easiest way than just to list them. Uh, and you can find them on autism today, which is called the 14 signs of autism. So it can be inappropriate laughing or giggling, no real fear for, of danger. They seem to have inappropriate um, uh, insensitivity to pain. They look like they don't feel pain, but they do. They just don't know how to express pain the way we do it. Uh, most of them don't wanna be cuddled or hugged or kissed. They prefer to have this sustained, unusual, repetitive behavior. It can be just putting like tomato paste cans next to each other. It can be arranging blocks in a certain color. It can be anything. It's a sustainable and it's unusual type of repetitive behavior, which can be problematic if, if you are trying to teach this child um, something because they're very focused on that behavior or this phrase. Most of them avoid eye contact, which is basically eye-to-eye -eye contact. They prefer to be alone. They have difficulty expressing their needs. And sometimes they use gesture, which is their own hands or actually somebody else's hand. They hold somebody's hand and then point with them. They seem to be inappropriately attached to objects. It can be like a teddy bear, can be a certain uh, toy that they like or even food or pillowcase, whatever. They just like it too much. They are insist on the sameness, doing the same things over and over again. They echo words of phrase. So if you ask someone, how are you? They usually say, how are you back? They don't understand that they have to now remove you and put I, and it, it's so complicated. And they have difficulty interacting with others. 
sometimes they just like to spin things, you know, back all over. Uh, it can be something spinnable or, or just like spin anything, basically. They have inappropriate response or sometimes no response to sound. And usually parents who have uh, autistic children, usually they think that they can't hear first and they do like a hearing test. Then they found out that they have autism. A lot of parents went through this. If you really try to group these, you will see that this is how it, that autism is diagnosed. So there are two measures domain. You have the social and communication deficit and you have repetitive behavior and restricted interest. And these are the two domains that actually is the criteria for diagnosis according to the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition, or what we call the DSM-5. And this is how diagnosis now, how autism now is diagnosed worldwide. Uh, very important that you have to, to remember that not all kids or adults with autism will have the exact same 14 signs and not with the same combination and not with the same degrees of severity. They can have mix and match of any of these. And that makes it difficult. It's, as I said, it's not just a number like hypertension, it's more than that. And if you also like take a deeper look into these signs and symptoms, you will notice that they are just afraid of unknown. So they prefer to do the things they know. They prefer to wear the clothes they know. It is, this pajama seems to be comfortable. Why should I try something else? This pair of shoes seems to be good. Why should I do something else? This movement of this object, if I have now this pen and I keep moving it this way, well, no surprises here. It's just gonna keep moving. So no unknown. It, the, the unknown is what makes them scared. So they prefer to be by themselves. They limit their interaction with others because they don't know what's gonna come out, out of this interaction. They insist on the sameness. They echo the same words or phrase because it just, it's their comfort zone. And that's why more and more they become a little bit isolated. And this is where the name autism or tawahud came from. All right, so these are the signs. Now let's see communication. So a big domain is communication. So why I'm making a big deal about communication? Because now as healthcare professional, we're trying to communicate with them. So communication, as I mentioned earlier, an autistic patient with no spoken language may be actually able to read and write at the graduate level and they have no words, zero. So they have zero verbal communication, but they can communicate in different ways. Also, an autistic patient who speaks fluently might actually not understand what he or she is talking about. They don't have a, a full comprehension of the language. They might have still profound learning disability, but just because they are able to speak, you might think, oh, they will understand. Not necessarily. Also, they have difficulty processing information quickly and in real time. Like for example, all of us now on the call, when I move from slide 11 to slide 12, all of you were, were say like, oh, so she is moving forward. This takes a couple of seconds. It, you know, we have to pass the signs and symptoms now and, and see or hear what she is talking about. Most of uh, uh, children or adults on the spectrum, they will have difficulty process that that quickly. So we have to, they have to absorb, digest, take their time, and they might miss important information because you just said it too quickly uh, and then they miss it. Like if, if, for example, if we have someone now on the spectrum on this call, going from this slide to this slide, they are still focusing on what I said here and they miss all of that. So now when I'm talking about communication, they cannot really correlate. And that becomes more and more difficult when you are trying to relate information to them. Uh, so they don't like surprises. They like to be informed. They like to take their time. And they don't understand also the tone, the tone of voice. Sometimes we have like loud voice to emphasize something or very soft to emphasize something different. We have facial expression. We can be happy or sad when we say certain words. And we have all of these social cues. We understand what this means. They don't understand that. And they take words literally. So you can just say, you know, for example, it's, it's lunchtime. Well, if we say it's lunchtime, usually people means we want to eat but you didn't say we want to eat. You just said it's lunchtime. So it's lunchtime, this is a fact. It's not really, uh, it doesn't mean that we, we will eat. So you have to say it more that it's lunchtime, we are going to eat. 
And that has to be really right before uh, the uh, event happened. That also added to the complexity of the event. They don't understand body language as well, or as I said, sarcastic language. They try to avoid eye contact, but not because they're avoiding eye contact doesn't mean they're not listening to you. They might be listening to you, but with no eye contact. Again, that's that add to the complexity. So this little boy in here, not really making eye contact with his teacher. Okay, so what I described now seems to be complicated, right? It's a communication differences that makes it extremely difficult for healthcare professional pharmacists in particular to communicate directly and efficiently with their patient. Do you agree? I wanna some interaction. I have a lot of uh, screens now with no pictures or voices. So just put something in the chat or, or talk. Just unmute yourself and talk. or type it in the chat. All right, we have some yeses now. Yes, it is actually complicated. It is very hard. Thank you so much for those who respond. Yes, very difficult, exactly. It's extremely difficult for pharmacists to communicate directly and efficiently with their patients um, and to provide consultation or appropriate drug information or the relationship that we really want between the patient and their pharmacist. So there's clearly a communication gap between you know, healthcare professionals in general and pharmacists in particular. Uh, and the reason why I'm you know, interested in pharmacists in particular, because I come from a school of pharmacy and you know, I, this, is, this is what we do. So providers really find themselves communicating more with the caregivers or parents or whoever is coming with this person, not with the patient themselves. So think about it now, you have a mom and you have like a six year old or seven year old, you know, mom or dad coming to your pharmacy, usually you're gonna to talk to the mom or dad and that's very acceptable. He's a kid, you know, I'm not saying kid with autism, he's a kid. This is usually what you do. You talk to the caregiver, you talk to the parents, you talk to someone who you rely on relaying the information uh, back to their kids or being responsible. But now when the patient themselves are adults, that's harder and that's mostly unwelcomed and sometimes create embarrassment for them because you're talking on their behalf, you're totally ignoring their presence and that becomes difficult for them. And think about them, you know, like they have feelings just the way we do, they, they can be embarrassed. They just don't know how to express this. So this is a, a, a quick graph that shows, do they actually need healthcare services more than others? Actually, yes, or unfortunately, yes. So here is patient with ASD. They, on average, have eight to two visits with patients who are not on the ASD. In terms of costs, three to seven times more expensive if you have ASD than not having ASD. And these numbers, again, take it with a grain of salt. This is in the US that does not translate in, in, uh, in all uh, other countries, but it's going to be similar. Maybe not 1.4 million, but it's going to be five times the, the, the regular cost. It's going to be different than uh, in, in several, in certain countries than the US, but still very expensive. And that's a the huge, huge, huge number when you talk about 230 to 260 billion dollar for autism services in the US alone. That's that's huge. This is huge. So they need healthcare worker. They need us. They need healthcare professional to be able to communicate with them. So uh, let me uh, look at the chat. Uh, so we have not common to communicate with them directly. Parents usually communicate with the healthcare provider. This is correct, Dr. Ali. That's, the, that's actually the problem, Dr. Ali, that that will happen. And usually they communicate only with the healthcare provider. Um, I'm not sure what that means. They communicate directly with the healthcare provider or, or the parents communicate with the healthcare provider. So let's have this a scenario. So now we have a scenario and this scenario is saying you are the pharmacist at a community pharmacy. And then the patient came in in the mid forties or so and they have very limited eye contact. The patient is making const constant vocalization, something like, or like, you know, doing this with their fingers or 
flapping their hands or avoiding eye contact. So learning what you we learn today, you might you know interpret this uh, body language that this uh, individual might have autism. And then this patient came with a younger brother who was in early twenties. And then the doctor prescribed a new medication to the four year old. Now as a pharmacist, whom are you be talking to and why? I kind of guessed where this is gonna go, but I want you to be able to, to respond. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Bashar. We should be equipped with some skills to communicate with them. Exactly, this is exactly what I wanted to hear. And Dr. Ali, yes, you're gonna be communicating with a younger brother. That's 99.9% .9 of us here on the call will say the same thing. But think about it from their perspective. Is this fair that we are always, always, always communicating? Well, so what will the brother do? That's the question. This 20-year-old brother. This 20-year-old brother somehow will be able to communicate back to his older brother about what happened in the pharmacy. So if the younger brother can communicate at certain point or, or with a certain way, we should be able to communicate as well, or at least try to communicate, or at least show them that we want to communicate. Then it can be further communicated with the product. So that's really what I'm hoping to do in here. So I took this with me, and then now the second uh, uh, part of my talk is, are you prepared to provide care? So this is a, um, uh, a recent publication that we just published. Uh, in 2022, six weeks ago. And that was actually, and I, I, I see that Dr. Heba Isa is on the call with us. Uh, she did a, a tremendous work with that. And I did this with Luis Lavora and Noel Biancoli. Those were two students doing what we refer to as API, Advanced Pharmacy Practice Experience with me as their uh, 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 preceptor. So, and we have Dr. Mann was actually in the, uh, she is in the applied behavior analysis in our university or back to my former university. And this is how all of that became uh, the study. So the study was to know how pharmacists perspective in this, on disparities in quality care provided to adult patients. So we asked them similar questions that I'm asking you right now, but we had some statistics, some data to see how can we help or where is the gap basically. So that's exactly going to Dr. Bashar, it's like we need to, to learn how. And again, the link to this publication will be in the, in the reference link at the, last, at the last slide. So that's what we did. We gave an online questionnaire that was created using just Google form. Uh, we had IRB approval uh, from our institution at that time was University of St. Joseph. The questionnaire was sent to healthcare provider, basically hospitals, pharmacists and clinics in the Northeast region. All participants were kept anonymous and de-identified, so they can pretty much say uh, whatever they feel or strongly believe their, um, their answers one way or another. Uh, in this whole study was done in six weeks because this is the time that the, the students are with me. So that can be a limitation as well. I'm saying this upfront. We had 116 participants completed the online questionnaire over two weeks period of data collection. And the majority of them were pharmacists followed by nurses, and then less participation of other healthcare professionals. Actually, instead of reading them, let me show it to you in here. So in the profession, pharmacists were the majority. And again, because we're coming from school of pharmacy, we were really, we care more about the pharmacist perspective. And now if I go back in time, I probably should have only limited to pharmacists, but that didn't happen at this point because when you send it to like in-house, uh, I mean, inpatient hospitals, sometimes other healthcare professionals respond to the survey. Pharmacists was like, you know, 63%. We have nurses right after, and then, you know, very few from medicine and very few from others. In terms of year of practice, this span across all years of practice. We have people responding who have less than five years of practice and people responding who have more than 20 years of practice. And they still respond the same thing. So we haven't done anything in 20 years to help. And in terms of where they come from, they came mainly from hospital inpatient followed by hospital outpatient. And then we have a, a big chunk of community pharmacy as well. And then outpatient uh, clinic, uh, and then very few from independent pharmacies. 
Of course, the setup here in the US is different than the Arab world. I know the Arab world, there's a lot of community pharmacists who probably will be responding to that faster. And I am by all means looking to repeat this same questionnaire and same survey in a place like Iraq or in, in the Arab world in general, and see if we're gonna get different perspective or different answers of different, of different ratio, and how can we help? Then we ask them about comfort. Are you comfort, or, or as a healthcare provider, how comfortable are you in communicating with patients with ASD? And that's what we got. 43% saying that, I'm not sure, I don't know what to do. And then we had like, you know, on the other side, we have, very comfortable, like 10%. And then a lot of people say uncomfortable, 20%. And then we have in between. So if you just take the comfortable, it's pretty much you're adding those together as like 30% comfortable and 70% are not comfortable. This is huge. This is a huge number. Then are you prepared as a provider? Are you prepared to provide patients with ASD quality care, same exact ratio. I'm not sure, I'm not prepared. Only 4% say they, said that they are prepared and somewhat prepared like 20%. So one quarter of all participants say that they are prepared. And again, 75% are not prepared to provide healthcare to autistic patients, despite those alarming numbers that I gave you in the beginning. Again, this is very scary. When we ask them about additional training, what did you do to be prepared? So we asked, did you have training on, the, on your own? Did you have training offered by the employee? Uh, I mean, by the employer? Do you have any specific communication protocol or guideline in place where you work? And again, the numbers were shocking. We had only four out of 116 said that, yes, we had some type of training. And I'm talking in 2020 in the US. So that's, that's the shocking number. And even for those who said they have some training, said that because the employer forced them to have the training. And then some of them said, yes, I have attended the provider. Most of them did not even attend when there was a training. And they said, yes, but it wasn't that helpful. And they only attended because it was mandatory. You know, it's, it's just a scary, scary, scary chart to see. And if there's any communication protocol or guideline in place, only again, three said that there's something in place where they work. But the majority, again, refer back to this 116. It's so hard to have any, uh, it, it's just shocking to hear that. Uh, we have someone on the chat, Dr. Shaima, said that we feel uncomfortable because we need practice how to deal with them. That's exactly my, my point, is we need to do something. We just cannot just ignore the fact that they exist. The numbers are alarming. They're one in 44 in a couple of years, might be one in 20 or so. That means, you know, 5%. This is, this is huge. This is everywhere. And I'm not actually going to ask, you know, like, you know, maybe by share of hands or by, you know, how many of you know someone on the spectrum? I'm going to get to that in, in, in a couple of minutes. But that's, that's scary. So that's what we found. So we asked them, so how can we help? So, and that's what we got. We got that continuing edu education workshop, something that what we're doing right now to really um, specialize patient. Uh, I mean, this will be a focus on patient with ASD. What I'm doing right now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not practice pharmacist in the US. I have a pharmacy degree from Asia, but I'm not practicing in this country. But I know that some of you or many of you on the call are actually practice pharmacists in your country as well. So we need, we need continuing education to focus on uh, uh, communication, how to communicate with them. We need additional training. We need 80% um, of the people who ask that we need ad additional training. And some of them also say that they are very open to innovative communication aids or apps or tools or technique. We live in a high technology world. We might be able to, to get apps that can facilitate this communication. I, again, I do have a, a, a great uh, grant proposal opportunity that requires the development of an app that we believe as a team after this uh, publication that can help them a lot. It's an app with, with, uh, with QR codes attached to it and we can help tremendously. Uh, and again, I'm very open to any collaboration in, in that sense. Okay, now where in the PharmD curriculum 
is a good fit to educate future pharmacists on the topic. Because the, if we are not really educating the next generation of pharmacists, it's, the problem is gonna exist. Remember these pharmacists have like 20 years of experience. Some of them do, and they still respond the same way. So if we're not changing what we're doing now, we're gonna end up with the same results. So we need to add ASD in your curriculum. So let me ask that. Do you have any topic in that require uh, the, the, the students in your, uh, at University of Baghdad to know anything about ASD in like a neurology course, communication course, extracurricular course, co-curricular course, summer course, elective, anything. Do you have anything uh, at this moment that actually teach students uh, about ASD and ASD patients? Dr. Kauthar or Dr. Ali? Okay. Yes, that's a very common answer, that it's a no. But again, remember, those are your future pharmacists. So if they didn't study anything in their pharmacy curriculum in their four years or five years, they will not be prepared. No matter how much training you're gonna give them after, they need to be introduced to that at their pharmacy curriculum level. And since we are pharmacy educators, I wanna bring that up here. So in the neurology course, you can have one to two lectures on ASD. I used to teach this uh, um, lecture. Pharmacy communication course. You know, if you have a course that, that talks about communication, add a, a, a lecture or two about patient with actually different disabilities and try to teach and get expert to teach and try to, te to, to teach the students how to communicate with people with different disabilities. I'm talking more about developmental disability, not physical disability. Um, Co-curricular course, summer course, for example, with like extra credit or something that they get to gain something out of, or elective course. Um, uh, again, in my former institution, I had an elective course about cultural competency in pharmacy education. And this is like now in my, uh, my current uh, uh, institute, I'm including a patient with different disability in the curriculum. This is gonna be this fall, so it's still uh, not ready yet to be implemented, but this is something on the horizon that I'm working on. Webinars, workshops, continuing education courses. It's a big topic. We don't, it, we, we, we can't just ignore it. it. They are among us, they are around us. They are our kids, our uh, brothers and sisters. We, we need to do something. We can't just let that go. So Dr. Ali said we have communication skills course. Yes, this is a great course to add that. Yeah, on communication with those vision, hearing, speech. Yes, and then add ASD. Because this is, you know, vision, hearing, those are clear. When someone cannot see or someone cannot hear, this is very, very clear. And usually you have one way of communication. So ASD will be another lecture or, or, or make the students do something on their own and come up with like a project or a presentation, how to communicate with ASD patients. Great examples. So now let me give you some tips that we got out of the literature search that we did to, to come up with this publication and also as parents, uh, which is the tales of tomorrow that, uh, that I would like to, to speak to you about as well, which is the last uh, part of my talk today. So as pharmacists, I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks might be helpful, uh, but you can capitalize on that as much as possible and as parents as well. So clearly one size doesn't fit all. You know, we have also a lot of adults on the spectrum. They have no idea, they have lack of, sufficient knowledge in health topics like health, high, healthy hygiene habits, how to live a healthy lifestyle, how to exercise, what to eat, what not to eat, preventive medical, preventive dental, they have no idea. There's no communication and they have no idea. So their health deteriorate over time because of that, because most of us can learn this on your own, or at least you can be, uh, uh, you can either learn it on your own or or you can get good communication to learn about this. This can be so many factors, including society. I'm not blaming the society right now, I'm trying to find solutions. So that's that can be a big problem. However, we need to, so that mean, means the health care will deteriorate over time. Plus being on the AST, uh, being uh, uh, on the spectrum in general, remember those 14 signs? Some of them needs to be 
some of these symptoms become very, very, very hard in the person's life and interfere with their quality of life for them and for people around them. We need to also treat that. So we, a lot of these patients are taking medication for life. Um, to, to just give some examples, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are one of these. You have two FDA approved drugs to treat autism. Again, it's not treat means cure. It's just to minimize the, the, the symptoms that interfere with their life so they can actually learn and communicate. So they are, they are patients for life. Plus this, that makes it healthcare, their healthcare also deteriorate over time. So what we learned that communication had to be patient specific, which is hard because you never, you need, you cannot generalize. It has to be particular to this patient. So for community pharmacists, for those of you who work on community pharmacy, you probably have the same patients coming back over and over again, a neighbor or someone in the same uh, uh, proximity to your pharmacy and they come back. So the more you know them, the more information you can possibly gather about the, the, their communication level, about their preferred communication mode uh, prior to their visit. And that will help you with your communication with them. And over time, you're gonna learn their names, you're gonna learn something that they like. You might you know, mention this one time, they will open up to you a little bit. One time after a time, especially community pharmacists, I'm very, uh, a, I'm a firm believer that it's gonna, the, the best communication is gonna happen at the community pharmacy level. The, the hospital is a little harder, but at the community pharmacy level, absolutely this is, can be done, but it needs a lot of work from us. These are also some tips. So for example, I said that they take language literally and they require precise language. So be very, very concrete and specific about what you say and what you don't say. So for example, don't say this will hurt for a minute or how do you feel? Or can you stand up? Well, how do you feel? I feel okay because I don't know what else, what other answer I can give you. I'm talking now if, I'm, if I am an autistic patient. Uh, can you stand up? Well, the answer is yes, I can. Can you stand up doesn't mean stand up. Can you stand up means can you? So the answer is yes, I can. Remember, they take it literally. So you're very, very, it's a fine line to really get the information across, but be careful not to interpret it different, different way. So instead of saying, how do you feel? You can say, do you have cough? This is very specific now. And then the answer can be yes or no. Or can you stand up? You can say, please stand up. Very simple, very simple, you know, as I said, very fine line can make a big difference. They can actually now stand up because you ask them to stand up. But if you say, can you stand up? It's yes, I can. And then if you say this will hurt for a minute, they might actually look at their watch to, to count a minute. So don't say that, just say it will hurt or feel uncomfortable for a little while. Again, this is in English and translating this in Arabic might be also another level, but I'm trying to give you some hints and I know you're, uh, you're, uh, uh, you can generalize that. Also, they have experience and anxiety if unable to answer question with complete accuracy. Remember, patient that is, remind patient that it's okay and if they don't know the right answer. So for example, if you ask them, you know, did you, uh, have you been eating foods high in vitamin K? This is very, very broad, very hard. Even if they are educated, they will come, even if they know what food are, are high in vitamin K, they will come with a list of all of this food and trying to rule in or out which one did they eat or not eat. Th they are perfectionists, so don't go this route. You can ask in the last week, did you eat food rich in vitamin K, such as broccoli or spinach? You know, now, now you make it you know, better. Did you experience any side effect? Don't make it broad, be specific. Did you experience nausea, for example? Did you vomit? Did you have diarrhea? That's much, much simpler. More, don't assume that patient is inattentive because they are not, because they are not looking at you or they are making repetitive movement. Remember, this repetitive movement is part of what they like. So uh, if they do that, don't be impatient. Don't force patient to make eye contact. And don't assume that if they can, that the patient cannot understand the information uh, because they did not respond back. So make sure they understand. You can probably uh, uh, use written information. If the patient like can read, you can put this in writing. You can put com you can use communication card. You can actually have the patient pre-record the information. 
you can uh, encourage patient to use all of these new communication devices. They can put appointment on their phone. They can put the pills uh, when they're going to take the pills to their phone and, and, uh, and all of that. It's just don't speak too fast. Be able to have some time for them. And then the more you know the patient, the more you're going to be able to communicate. Of course, this is way too much information for all of you in a few minutes. And that's why I'm going to provide this presentation. And please, you know, look look for that. Dr. Summer Nicholas, uh, uh, she did a co-curricular course, and we are collaborating in this. And those were her uh, take-home tips. So I'm giving her full credit, full credit for these uh, couple of slides that she provided us uh, with. Very, very, very helpful tips. So just take one at a time and see what works and what doesn't. It's not. Remember, one size does not fit all. If you just remember that, that might help. You can also help them set up an alarm when they take the pill, uh, their pills. You can link the act of taking a pill to a specific part of the daily routine. You can say, take medication right before bedtime, rather than take medication in the evening. This is very broad. They don't like, they like specific. They like things to be concrete. They don't like those, like give them like flexibility. They don't like flexibility. They don't like unknowns. They like things to be specific. Tell, tell them, take the medication at seven o'clock. That's much easier than in the evening. Uh, just make it correlated with something simple that they can do. And the next time when you see them ask, did you take the medication at seven o'clock? And then you can have this on their phone or alarm or anything simple. And then, or like pill box that has the number on it or something like that. And then ask again follow up, they will, they will like that. And then they will open up to you. And then it will be amazing how much you can actually communicate. You can even, most of them think in pictures and like to be told in advance what's going on. So create visual schedule. You know, again, be creative, be innovative. This is, this is huge. And, and you can even publish that. You can publish all of that. Uh, that's from the professional side of the story, but even on the personal side of the story, becoming the perfect pharmacist who can communicate with all people at all levels. So there is uh, the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit. This is actually the, the, the link to that. They have like a so many visual aids that you can probably use when you're communicating with them. So for example, if you want to communicate that this patient wants to say, okay, aspirin 81 milligram, and this is helpful for your heart and take one pill by mouth once a day. And then you put the shape of the pill and you put the morning, that's more than enough and give it to them. So they have it in their hand. They read it over and over again. They will be proud of what they are doing. They understand what you said, and then they will have time to observe, absorb and, and digest. Then when they come the next time, they can bring it back and then you can add a little bit and a little bit. Remember, most of them are patients for life. They're taking this medication for life. So it's not like just, I'm not talking about like, oh, they had like, you know, um, a, a cold or, or uh, something uh, like acute. I'm talking more about the chronic. Something acute, if they have cough for a, 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 you know, a week and they have to take, you know, like a, a antitussive, Probably it's okay if you can't communicate that much in a week, but if they're taking something like this, like lysinopril or furosemide or aspirin or, for life, yeah, there might be a way to communicate because now the, they're gonna be, the, you're gonna have this proud, they're gonna be proud uh, of their ownership of this medication. And as I said, they're gonna open up to you. I really like that, that people are, are actually seeing those as very helpful tips. I'm so glad that, and uh, I have many, many more. <laughs> I can talk forever, but I know I have a limited time. So as parents, now this is the last part of my talk, as parents, and Dr. Kauter asked me specifically to talk about the tales of tomorrow. So I'm a proud mother of a 26 year old, wonderful young man with autism. Uh, his name is Ziad. Uh, so from this uh, couple of slides till the end, um, I am Om Ziad. Uh, forget about the PhD and the pharmacy degree and all of these things, I'm just Om Ziad. So as Omziad, we, we do, as other parents, we do our best to really explain life events uh, to our children, you know, regardless of their age. We want also to talk about and answer their unspoken questions. Remember, they do have questions. They just cannot verbalize it. They cannot say what they, what's in their mind, but the question is there. So our job now as on the other side to understand the question before they answer it, before they ask and then try to find answer. So that is, this is a great way of communication. 
So I prepare my own son to all life events, big or small, by writing stories for him. And that's what Dr. Kautha wants me to share with you all. So I picked one that will be relevant to the, today's topic. I write all of these stories in advance, and you can probably see in advance bold and underline, because this is the key word for success. They need to know things in advance. They don't like surprises, they don't like unknowns. So the night before the event, I write a customized story for my son in his own language, something that he can read. And I'm telling him what is going to happen the next day. Of course, I cannot predict everything that's gonna happen. I learned over the years to modify things that, you know, I put some language here that give us some flexibility if things don't work out. And then by time he was just waiting for this printout to come out of the printer and then he will read it over and over and over again and, and answer all his questions. So he's prepared. I wrote really like 400 or plus, I have like big binders. Actually, I was gonna bring it to here. I have the huge binders in the last 17 years or so. Uh, and then after the, you know, last year in particular, people told me, well, you have to really do something about that. So uh, I, uh, I started to make short videos to tell people what I did. And I'm gonna share one with you today, which is four minutes, which is pre perfect for ending this um, uh, presentation. Let me see now how I can do that. And there is also like a Facebook page that has all the, the, the stories that we had so far and I had all the links in the back. Let me see if I stop sharing this here. And then, let me share that. من سلسلة فيديوهات حدود البكرة. من أد... أهلا بكم. حدود البكرة. Oh no. Okay. So how to see it then? I think you need to share the browser. Like change the share. Oh, not the desktop, but the the browser, or like open up the browser somehow, so we can not not the desktop. One second, let me. So not the desktop one or two. It should be this. Let's see. Can you see that? No. Uh, yes. You can. Yep. All right. So that this is actually the page. This has tales of tomorrow. Uh, so basically, in Arabic, I call this hadutid bukra, which is basically it's the preparation of advance in the night before. So I call it Tales of Tomorrow. The video I'm going to share is actually all in Arabic. There are some English ones as well, but I felt like, you know, people from the Arab world, especially Peran, just like myself, have a lot of need to have things in Arabic. So I'm going to share with you now Ziyara Al-Ayadit uh, al-Doktor, since we are talking about the healthcare visit and the healthcare communication. So hopefully you will see how I prepared my own son and how you can actually, again, as professionals and as parents do that. So I will do this now. Can you see this, Dr. Kauther? Yes. Yes. أهلا بكم في حدوتة جديدة من سلسلة فيديوهات حدوتة بكرة. بنقدمها لأسر أطفال التوحد. من خلال خبرتي الشخصية كأم لشاب عمره 25 سنة من ذوي التوحد اسمه سيادة. حدوتة بكرة عبارة عن قصة اجتماعية بنكتبها علشان نحضر أطفالنا من ذوي التوحد لكل الأحداث الحياتية الكبيرة منها والصغيرة. القصة لازم تتكتب قبل الحدث على الأقل بيوم علشان كده اسمها حدوت البكرة. حدوت البكرة الناجحة بيكون فيها الست أركان اللي احنا شايفينهم قدام. لازم نبدأ باسم الطفل ومعلومات شخصية عنه. لازم نوصف حدث بكرة بإجازة وبساطة ونجاوب على أسئلة الطفل مش قادر يسألها. لازم نسرد حقائق ومش آراء شخصية. لازم نشجع التصرفات الإيجابية للطفل ودايما دايما إحساس دايم بالفخر. ده حبيبي سياد ودي أنا. أنا كانت تروح حواديت كتير قوي في 17 سنة اللي فاتت أكتر من 400 حدود. هشارك بيهم معاكم في الفيديوهات دي إن شاء الله. تعالوا نشوف مثال. اسم الحدودة زيارة لعيادة الدكتور إيهاب. أنا اسمي زياد وأنا ولد كبير وشاطر. بكرة أنا هروح مع ماما 
زيارة لعيادة دكتور إيهاب أنا بحب أروح للدكتور أبو وده بيندرج تحت اسم الطفل ومعلومات شخصية عنه كلنا لازم نروح للدكتور بتاعنا عشان يطمن علينا ويتأكد إن جسمنا كويس ويشوف لو في حاجة بتوجعنا يكتب لنا دواء علشان نخف ده بقى بيندرج تحت حقائق وليس آراء شخصية دي بتزود مصداقية الحدوتة وبتخلي الطفل يعرف معلومات عامة مش شرط رأيك الشخص يوم الثلاث 27 يونيو 2021 أنا عندي معاد مع دكتور إيهاب الساعة 10 الصبح أنا هركب العربية وأروح مع ماما عيادة الدكتور إيهاب. أنا دلوقتي هنبدأ نوصف مع بعض حدث بكرة بإيجاز وبساطة. أنا هاخد معايا القصص اللي أنا بحبها وهاخد معايا التليفون بتاعي. ممكن كمان آكل ساندويتش في العربية أو أشرب عصير. لما نوصل العيادة لازم الأول نركب الأسانسير. هنا إحنا بنجاوب على أسئلة الطفل مش قادر يسأل عنها. العيادة دي مكان بيكون الدكتور موجود فيه علشان يقابل الناس العيادة ممكن يكون فيها ناس كتير وكل واحد بياخد دوره علشان يقابل الدكتور العيادة كمان فيها لعب كتير وفيها تلفزيون وفيها أوضة الدكتور تاني بندي حقائق مش أراء شخصية علشان نزود المعلومات العامة عند الطفل ماما هتقول لي أنا دوري إمتى عشان لازم أستنى دوري أنا ممكن أسمع الأغاني اللي بحبها على التليفون بس لازم ألبس سماعة أنا كمان ممكن أقرأ القصص اللي أنا بحبها في العيادة لما يجي دوري هندخل أنا وماما للدكتور في الأوضة بتاعته برضو هنا بنجاوب على الأسئلة اللي الطفل مش قادر يسأل عنها وبنشجع التصرفات الإيجابية وقت الحدث دكتور إيهاب هيسألني عن اسمي وعندي كم سنة وعن الحاجات اللي بحب أعملها أنا هجاوب كل الأسئلة علشان أنا ولد كبير وشاطر الدكتور بعدها هيكشف عليا وده مش بيوجع خالص أنا لازم أنام على السرير علشان الدكتور يشوف إن جسمي سليم وكويس ولو في حاجة بتوجعني أنا هقول للدكتور بنكمل وصف الحدث وبنكمل إجابة الأسئلة اللي الطفل مش قادر يسأل عنها أنا وماما هنروح ناكل آيس كريم بعد ما نخلص زيارة الدكتور وبعدين هنروح البيت أنا مبسوط قوي إن أروح مع ماما زيارة لعيادة دكتور إيهاب. ماما وبابا دايماً فخورين بيا. هنا إحنا بننهي الحدث بنوضح إزاي وإمتى الحدث هيخلص مع تعزيز لحاجة الطفل بيحبها. طبعاً تشجيع التصرفات الإيجابية وزي ما قلنا الإحساس الدايم بالفخر والحب ده مهم جداً لأنه ركن هايل من أركان الحدودة. في آخر حاجة بنراجع الحدودة نقول تاني. مين وازاي وامتى وفين مين هيروح للدكتور ماما وزياد هنروح فين عياده الدكتور ايهاب ازاي بالعربيه امتى يوم الثلاث 27 يونيو 2021 وتوته توته خلصت الحدوته نشوفكم على خير في حدوته جديده من حدوته بكره ابعتوا لنا اقتراحاتكم على صفحتنا في الفيسبوك تحبوا تسمعوا اي حدوته I stopped sharing. I don't know if if you have any questions. I'm sorry if that was a little longer, but I want to get my points across. That really, that makes a huge. Can you hear me, Dr. Kauter? Now? Yes, yes, Dr. Ara. Thank you, thank you very much. So, يعني حقيقة ال ال الأركان اللي أنا كتبتها في الحدوتة وإن ال ال ستة أركان إن إحنا لازم نشرح بالتفصيل ولازم نشرح ببساطة ولازم نقول كل المعلومات اللي احنا نقدر نقولها ونجاوب على الاسئله اللي الطفل مش قادر يسال عنها ونحسسه دايما بالفخر والحب بالطريقه دي احنا ممكن ننقل اي معلومه وكل معلومه للاطفال مش الاطفال بس انا ابني عنده 25 سنه 26 دلوقتي طالما بنكتب بالتفاصيل دي كلها it can be done so this is really my take home message for this is the communication is you we can communicate whatever it takes but we can communicate it just needs effort needs time, needs patience, needs to, to put your heart into it, and it will work. Let me uh, end with the, uh, the few slides I have left. So basically, we learned today about autism awareness and autism knowledge and autism training. I, I try to give you some tips here and there that I think might be helpful. 
you're gonna have the presentation itself with Dr. Coulter and all the links are in the back. And I always like this, it is not disability, it's different ability. They are able, they are capable. They just need us to help them to reach to that stage. I don't like the word disability because it makes them unequal. Uh, they are differently able. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. And here are the links of everything else I have talked about, including this as well. I said um, I, I contribute Sarah, to Do you mind if you can share the slides because I don't think you've shared them. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so this is basically what we learned uh, today. Hopefully that makes uh, the presentation now come to the end. We talked about awareness and knowledge and some tips for training from a pharmacist's perspective and also from parents' perspective. And as I said, I like to call it different ability and not disability. Please use this term. It's just, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it has so many meanings. They are able and capable. They just need our help. And uh, I put the, at the end the references and links to all what I uh, discussed today, including an article that I also um, contribute to, to Autism and Us, which is a blog that uh, here in the US, they asked me last year and I contribute to that and talked about my experience with this, those stories as well, uh, if you would like to hear uh, about that. Uh, with this, I would like to take any questions and thank you so much for your time and for your, uh, Again, invitation is just such an honor being here with you all, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ola. Thank you very much for um, all these helpful tips. And I, I think you can see how much uh, the interaction and the appreciation for all the tips, especially you shared a, a very um, experienced personal story. And um, I see one of the I'm comments- I'm very proud and as a self-advocate, yes. I have I have no problem with that. I like yeah. to, to talk about uh, and, and we have a very great comment from Dr. Dia. Um, he says, I think that when you study this topic for students, you need to have a job to And I can't agree more. Yani, uh, فعلن, um, teaching from a book is different than teaching from an experience. Yeah. You have and, to personalize it. You have to customize yes. it. And I, I know we have a lot of the um, educators in, in pharmacology and in clinical pharmacy, communication skills are with us on this call. So I'm hoping they will start including um, the autism spectrum in their lectures. Absolutely, this, this, that would be great. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the interaction at the last part. I wasn't really seeing it because of the share, but 